Hi, episode 90 of Monday Night Chat. This is going to be a strange episode because we shoot all our episodes on a Friday and then we edit it on a Monday and then we put it up at Monday night. Now, we don't know what's happened to the Anwar move of, uh, you know, because the audience with the king has not happened as we speak. And also we don't know what's the Sabah uh, general election, which is tomorrow as we film. As such, this is going to be a simple Monday night chat. We're going to talk about economic lecture series continuing from the year 1980 to 19, uh, to 2020. And then we're going to do Q&A. That's it for Monday night chat this week. Monday night chat with Wong Chen. Brought to you by the Member of Parliament for Subang. Hi, this is the summarized version for Monday Night Chat on the History of Economics Part 3. We're going to look at the period from 1980 to all the way to 2020. Okay, so let's start at the period 1980 to 1997. Margaret Thatcher and Ronald Reagan started the neoliberal economics movement which dominated the world for the next 40 years. The hippies which I talked about last week became middle class executives and the young Gen X people, that's me, uh, embraced capitalism and became what we call yuppies. Okay? Unities also started promoting neoliberal economics even up to today. Corporate culture became more powerful, more greedy, and shareholders' value is, is the only considered real value. Now, in 1989, the Berlin Wall came down. That brought an end to communism. So the threat, from the, the, the threat of economic model from the East basically collapsed with that. Yeah? In the mid-1980s to 1990s, we had unfettered free market. We saw the rise of financial instruments of all sorts. You know, I remember this period because that was the boom period, even in Malaysia, 1990s. Yeah, we were worshipping people like Gordon Gekko, the fictional character in Wall Street. Yeah? Now, in 1995, for international trade, GATT G -A -T -T, became WTO to reduce more trade barriers and called for more freedom of movement, freedom of services, and most important, freedom of money the movement of money. Globalization has arrived 1995. Of course, we must understand that the dominant Western position today is a result of hundreds of years of protectionism. So it's quite ironic that they call us to open up when they in fact benefited hundreds of years of protectionism all the way from Adam Smith's time, from 1500 to Adam Smith and then to now. Now, on the plus side, we also saw on the political side, many rise of uh, democratic institutions in East Asia, in particular Japan, South Korea, and even in Southeast Asia, while we, didn't have, we don't have democracy today, or limited democracy today, we saw big improvements in health, education, even, even the economy grew. So all this happened during that time. Now, the concept of technological progress, privatization, productivity increase from usage of computer, industrial, uh, well, information technology and stuff like that. All this boomed, created economic growth at an even faster rate. Yeah? On the downside, it also created a fixation for the public with uh, you know, capitalism and in particular, stock market investment. Yeah? Now, all this came to a head in 1997. I remember this because this is my history, 1997 with the Asian financial crisis. Uh, then we start to see a lot of things go wrong for the East Asian economic growth. And we also started to see in the late 1990s the start or early signs of global warming. Now we move to the period 1997 to 2008. Out of this crisis of, of the Asian financial crisis, IMF prescribed a few things to liberalize the East Asian economies even further. Yeah? Uh, of course, Malaysia resisted it, but of course, we then had our problem uh, of growing slower than the rest of Southeast Asia. Um, now, credit to our former Prime Minister Najib, he tried to open up the economy, yeah? but you know, again, if you are stuck with cronyism, you're not going to open up and go very far. During this period of change, from 97 to 2008, we saw China rising non-stop. And today, it is really the, it, and became the de facto factory of the world. Elsewhere, we saw the expansion and emergence of high net worth individual, family offices, private banking, hedge fund, private equities, all this start to change the financial landscape of the world. Fiat money 
which started from the pullout from Bretton Woods in, in 1970s, became even cheaper money as government and companies loaded up on more and more on debt. Yeah? And now we're witnessing the second wave of fiat money, such as cryptocurrencies. With the banking sector further dere deregulated in 1999 due to Clinton's Glass-Steagall repeal, uh, financial companies merged into even bigger and became too big fa to fail. So when it did blow up in 2008, this was the genesis of it. Okay? Despite all the consolidation of corporate power, economic growth powered by the internet, e-commerce, biotech, telecoms, you name it, whatever out there, these advances in, in tech helped to stay off most of the economic problems we have today. Yeah? But since the 2008, it also exposed a corrupt underbelly in the economic system we have. Hence, moving from 2008 to 2020, let's look at what is, has really changed. This is very recent history by most accounts. Okay? One, concept of money. The dot franc tried to pull back the unregulated banking sector. We're seeing, you know, politically, on an everyday basis, the fight between the bankers' influence over politicians. Now, we have seen also QE programs, quantitative easing programs, where central banks create money to buy either distressed assets or government bonds. Yeah? And that made us into that last 10 years, central bankers into some sort of rock star uh, wizards, you know, trying to find solutions and delay recessions indefinitely by printing more and more money. Now, in this QE period that we live now, this money is now being used for good, for social good. Previously, QE was used to save all the bankers who behave quite badly, took a lot of risk. Now we're using it for social good. How long can we print more money? We have no idea. But QE is the situation when we look at money. Now, work. What does it tell you about work? In the last 10 years, yeah, during that period, 2008 all the way to 2020 today, we've seen workers' pays over the world falling behind and CO pays increasing at a faster rate. Today, a typical average American CEO is paid 400 times than the middle, than, than the mean uh, average salary of an American. Technology, we've seen incredible growth in technology. We've got, uh, you know, Apple, Amazon, Alphabet, Google Group, Microsoft, Facebook, Alibaba, Tencent is both from, from Asia and America. And we are also seeing the early signs of robotics and artificial intelligence. On international trade, international trade, which used to facilitate globalization and, and aim to make everybody richer, has now become a political football. And currently, China and America are engaged in great international fights. With the COVID-19, this situation may be even worse. That's it for this summarized version of History uh, of Economics, Part 3. For Q&A this week, we're not going to answer questions on the Anwar move because that hasn't happened yet when we film. And also, we're not going to talk about the Sabah elections. Instead, we're going to stick to a very simple five-question uh, Q&A session in 120 seconds. So, press the button now. Okay, first question. There has been, the ministry has been talking about introducing a carbon tax. Now, what is my views on this? I think it's a great idea. Yeah, because we've been pushing for a carbon tax for the last three years, I think, uh, in parliament. A couple of my speeches have been on that subject matter and our intern army has written a paper on carbon tax. Uh, so we are all for carbon tax. It is the single most important thing we can do to stop carbon emission. Number two, palm oil, another controversial subject matter. There's been a commentary out uh, last week about uh, having to improve. What do we need to improve really? Now, very simple. You need to go back to the science. We need to invest a lot of money on science and data and to show that we know, for instance, that palm oil is a superior oil in terms of yield production. And if you cancel palm oil around the world, you have to probably use eight to 10 times more land, arable land, which is limited to have palm oil. So we need the data and the science to be uh, pushed up and we need to engage the people a lot more. Number three, Malaysian collaborating with Russia on vaccine for COVID-19. Uh, my views are very simple. I think collaboration is a bit too technical for us at this moment. If anything, when the vaccines do come out, we should not rush to use it immediately because, you know, 
compared to other countries, relatively our, our infection rate is quite low, we should see how other countries perform and then, if need be, use those vaccines. Number four, uh, World Bank says that the developing countries have been hit hard, obviously, and that's because the economy is, is not great to start with, but their health system is, is particularly very bad. And the fact that when COVID comes and the health system is failing, kids are not going to school. So their future for the next, this COVID lasts for three, four years, even five years with God knows when. It, the, the future is not great for these developing countries. And lastly, quickly, the moratorium, 98% of banks say that they have uh, agreed to extend some sort of moratorium, even though it's not enforced by the government. We didn't say that this is okay, the banks are voluntarily doing it. I don't think that's really the case. That's just the number of calls that the banks do. Uh, the real number we don't know. As they say, there's statistics and there's lies from st statistics. That's it for Q&A this week.